All right, everyone, it's time for us to begin. Sunday mornings right after worship is not... Is the mic on? Do you have the mic on? Yep, the mic is on. Can you hear me now? No? All right. We'll shut the doors and whoever else comes in late, that's fine. Just a reminder that when this is finished, um, there's an open house at the Champs, and if you didn't pick up uh, directions and you plan to go, they're on the Welcome Center there. There's, I see a, a beautiful uh, flower there, so just look for the flower, the white flower, and you'll see the directions. So this morning, we have asked you to come for this uh, information meeting because we want to talk about a shift in our shepherding plan um, this is something that we have talked about at previous times. We had an informational meeting in March of this year. This is to follow up from that informational meeting in March to talk about implementation. So I'm going to spend um, a few minutes talking about the history of how we got to this point and why we're making this shift. And then uh, Jonathan will come up and talk about, well, what is this actually going to mean? Like, how, how, what is, how does this work? Uh, so I want to begin by talking about this from the perspective of our history, and then I want to talk about some principled convictions. So first, in terms of our history, uh, this is a transition from elder districts to life groups that are supervised by elders. So if you can move the next slide, please. Because my clicker's not working. There we go. Thank you. So in terms of the history, there have been various seasons of shepherding. So if you go back to the founding of our church, I don't know how many of you were here at that point. If you go back to 1998, so that's a long time ago, and my clicker is not working. There we go. Are you clicking it or am I? Oh, thank you. Whoever's arm just shot in the air, you're a good man or woman. So from 1998 to 2021, we've grown from approximately 10 families to over 350 members. Obviously, that is a very different uh, scale of things. When we started the planting church, shepherding was more organic. So if you can roll the next uh, click, that's exactly what it says. Um, it's not hard for us to understand that in a church of less than 100 people, you can know everyone very well. That's true not only for members, it's also true for the elders. So if you're not there for a Sunday or two, the elders will know that you're not there for a Sunday or two, and maybe something's going on, so they'll contact you. When the church becomes larger, it is more difficult to keep track of everyone, and that is something of what we've experienced. Next line. And so, in the growing church phase, there was need for district infrastructure. From the beginning of the church, where the elders simply knew who you were, to we moved to a district model. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that the districts were figured out according to zip code. So those are the zip codes that are overlaid on the greater Grand Rapids area. What we've been doing is saying if you belong to zip code, for example, 49301, which is the zip code I belong to, you are in this elder's district. And you can see how all those different geographic areas will then have different elders that supervise them. There are a lot of districts because there are a lot of zip codes. And the number of people falling within those districts continued to rise. So next slide, please. There's 49301. As I said, that is my district. The number of people within, within any particular district could be just a few or it could be Many, many, many people. And that led to sometimes elders having 30 to 50 people to supervise, to watch over, to care for, to pray for, to encourage, to challenge, to try to understand what's going on. And that became, it does become very, very difficult. So the advantage of a di district system is that it's very objective and geographic. You know if your post office a zip code is 49301, you belong to that particular district, and then we had an elder or two assigned to that district. 
You can see that they were personally trying to shepherd 30 to 50 people, as already noted. How many of you can even keep track of your five children? (laughs) My son has been in England for now six weeks, and if I've talked to him maybe once a week or every other week, that's it. And this is someone I'm very close to, care a lot about. I don't know what's going on day to day. It just becomes very, very difficult as the numbers continue to grow. It also means that if you moved, you moved from, say, East Grand Rapids to Ada, it would mean that you would move from one district to the next. Now, the big point of all of this is that the connection in those districts all went through the elder, generally. They weren't connections between people as much as they were connections through the elders. Now, again, when a church is very small, that makes a lot of sense. As a church continues to grow, that becomes more and more difficult And if I just put a little pause in here, that's become especially apparent over the last year and a half. That's become really, really apparent. That the bonds between people in the congregation are not as strong as we would like them to be, but also the bonds between particular people in a district and the elder were not strong. And my understanding is that has been true for a number of years. And as elders, that's been very, very challenging and disappointing. I've noted other times, I'll simply say it again, we have at times uh, when we have uh, gotten together as elders where we have just been heartbroken over the fact that there are people that we would like to have stronger connection with. We've not maintained those connections. Some of those are our fault. And sometimes it's also difficult just because you don't see people and you don't know them well. It's hard to have very deep conversations with people when you don't have a good, strong relationship. Next slide, please. So we're in a transition phase, but this is not the first transition that's occurred. Again, from 10 families to 350 members, that was the planting uh, phase where shepherding was very organic. You knew who everybody was, and so elders could easily keep track of those people. A growing church, we had a need for districts, try to organize things, and I already pointed out the district model. Now we're trying to move to a discipling church. And there are some very critical parts of this that I want to make apparent to you. We are implementing, and we have implemented, these small groups called life groups. And these are groups, as Jonathan will describe, that meet together frequently, and they spend time in fellowship as well as in the Word and in prayer. Now you'll notice this is a huge shift that I just want to make very overt to you. If in the past the shepherding occurred always through the elder and the connections were always through the elder in what we're moving to the shepherding still takes place by the elders and those the elders supervise but the connections are meant to happen more organically and frequently with each other because even if we had say 30 or 40 elders it would be very difficult for those elders to form the kind of relationships with each one of you that you already have and you're pursuing with other members in the congregation. And many of the things I struggle with and many of the things you may struggle with are not necessarily things that your elders would have to deal with, that they could help you with. You just need a friend, you need someone close to you to encourage you, to challenge you, to help you along. So these life groups are meant to foster an intentional community where you have love and concern for each other, you spend life together over long periods of time, and you provide a, this provides a shepherding strategy for elders as well, and Jonathan will lay that out in just a minute. But the big thing I want you to keep in mind is this moves it from everything going to the elders to the elders still shepherding, but it encourages closer connection among members of the congregation, one with each other, and that in itself is incredibly helpful in the way that we care for each other. The other thing I just want to add real quickly before I invite Jonathan up is that these life groups are also the most natural place to bring someone who is not a Christian or does not attend church. You're welcome always to bring them to a service. That's great. Many people who have not been in the habit of going to worship, who are not members of a church, find walking into a worship service incredibly intimidating. The single best thing you can do to help somebody who is intimidated by that is have a friendship with them so that when they show up, they already have a connection and they feel like they're not alone. 
These life groups provide that place where those friendships are first formed. In life groups that I've been a part of, whether it's the life group I'm pre- uh, presently a part of or the small groups I've been in in previous churches, that was not only a wish, like we want that to happen, that happened. And that happened with enough f- uh, frequency that we could say this is a very important on-ramp for people into the life of the church and their understanding of Jesus Christ. So just big picture, shepherding still occurs an intentional desire that people in the congregation would care for each other and these life groups provide a very natural on-ramp on-ramp for people who are new to the church who have not been churched or have no understanding of jesus christ at all if i can just put it i want to emphasize that one more time because it's a huge part of this the alternative to that is is very often we're going to have some huge event for people and they're going to show up and events are good We're going to do some of those ourselves. We have done some of them. But if you have an event without a place to connect people after that, you usually end up with very, very little success in terms of the mission of the church, which is not only to tell people about Jesus, but then to disciple them as they come to faith and give them a place where they can grow. And we want our church to be wide, but it also has to be deep. And these life groups provide not only the width, but they also provide much of the depth that we're looking for. They're complementary to the other pieces of what we're doing. So I'm going to pause here, invite Jonathan up. He'll give you some of the particulars. If you want to ask me questions about this after we're done here, I would love to answer questions about this. I often get a lot of questions about a lot of things in life. I don't mind answering them. But about this, I have a great passion, right? Because I really see this as one of the tools God has given us to help us make disciples to go wide as well as to go deep. So, Jonathan. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, So, uh, becoming a discipling church, right, one of the things that we uh, learned uh, as, you know, years ago, we had a few different uh, leadership teams go down to uh, Briarwood, and one of the key things we learned there was the importance of a healthy church pushing leadership downward and that as you grow and mature more and more people using their gifts getting involved uh, the deacons have learned that they have developed new uh, teams over these last few years and that has equipped them greatly to minister to our congregation Uh, and so we're seeing some similar things as well it's not going to be my friend be my friend all right so in, in this process of pushing leadership downward to a, a small group level or a life group level, uh, some of the methods that we began uh, with as far as the reason for gathering uh, are listed here. Now, life in life group stands for loving intentionally for eternity, right? Now, it doesn't mean that's, that's how long you stay together, right? You, you actually can move. We'll talk about that. But it's for the purpose of eternity, right? Loving intentionally, right? It's not accidental, right? What we actually accomplish in loving uh, one another, that it does require that extra bit of effort. So uh, for a lot of people, that intentionality comes the most naturally uh, when they're with a group of peers, people that are going through similar uh, life uh, things, ages and stages of life. And so they decided they want to be together uh, with a peer group. The first life group that I started a couple of years ago was exactly that, people similar ages and stages, and we just were able to connect on a number of things. Other people, they want the opposite of that. They want the most diverse uh, cross-section of the church that they can find, people that are you know, in college, people that are, um, you know, maybe newly married, people that are, are with little kids, people that are empty nesters, right? People that are, are older. And so, you know, they want to have that great cross-section, the older teaching the younger and just kind of have that, that element of the, of the church. Both of those are wonderful. And then I think most people were like, well, I certainly want people that live somewhere near me, right? I don't want to be driving from Ionia to Walker uh, to my small group. So, you know, at least having somebody that's close to me and the majority of groups are a common combination uh, of those. So uh, the essentials of a life group is the fact that it's about 6 to 12 people committed to confidential Christian care. Okay, so I say 6 to 12. Uh, now, you know, if, if you go above, you know, 10 is great. 10 is a great number. If you have to go to 12, you know, possibly. But after that, we want to start then dividing out into two groups of six because there's a, something that changes in human dynamics uh, after about 10. 
Uh, 12, if you're a really good leader, there was a really good leader in the past. His name was Jesus Christ. He did 12, right? He didn't do more than 12, okay? And that was a perfect group for him. It seemed to work because we're all here, right? So we're going to use his model. He really came up with something great. We're going to follow that. So uh, specifically committed to confidential Christian care. What happens in small groups stays in small groups, okay? What happens in life groups stays in life groups, right? That is intentionally ministering to one another. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't share a prayer request uh, of your own life uh, with the whole church. You can send out an email, but if there's certain things you just want your group praying for, then just have that care that's a little more intimate, a little more focused uh, on them uh, and not uh, to the whole church. You're welcome to have that. But this is a perfect ground. The life groups is a perfect place uh, for us to do the one anothering uh, of the New Testament, right? All the different verses that say, you know, love one another, you know, care for one another, right? Be patient with one another, forgive one another, like all the one another's. This is a perfect place for us to put those things uh, into practice as believers. Uh, Being part of a life group means there is an essential practice of the means of grace, right? The word of God and prayer. Now, at any time in the Christian's life, if they want to get together with other believers and have a game night or, you know, go bowling or whatever you want to do, by all means, you know, enjoy times of fellowship with other believers in groups. But just having activity doesn't make it a life group. It's specifically having a time in God's Word and a time in prayer, right? That's where our spiritual lives grow. We have to use those means if we're going to develop and grow as believers, right? So Word of God and prayer. And then uh, what we're asking for is for people to commit to one year being uh, with that group, and there's potential for carrying it on year after year. My first life group, right, we've been together for two years, and we're continuing uh, with that particular group. I have a second life group. We've been together for six months, and so far we're going to keep moving uh, along with that. And so it doesn't mean you can't change. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But for right now, these are the essentials of what we're trying to bring together as a discipling community, right, where we walk in grace together as we share uh, all of the the highs and the lows of life together, and we learn uh, what it is uh, to sit at the feet of Jesus and to grow in grace. And then uh, think about the frequency of meeting. What we're asking for is that life groups meet at least monthly, not to meet any less than monthly. Some groups meet twice a month. Ours meets, I, I have the first and third Uh, Thursday and the second and fourth Wednesday, uh, two different life groups that meet twice a month. Uh, Other people may want to meet weekly. You're very welcome to do that. Whatever works uh, for your group is the frequency, but we're just asking for no less uh, than um, uh, once a month. Uh, So what's the process? How do I get involved in a life group if I'm not currently involved in a life group? Now, if you go to our website and you go under the Connect page, uh, there is a place for, um, it just says life groups, and it says there's a life group interest form. And if you just fill that out, it has a few different uh, things that describe the type of group that you're looking for, right? One that's, you know, 10 minutes from my house, or one that's, you know, stu- um, you know with people that are my age, right? People that, you know, no, I want a more diverse group. Whatever you're looking for, you fill that out, and that helps me to know who to connect you with uh, in a life group. And so what we're asking for is you have two weeks to prayerfully consider you know, getting connected with a life group. You fill that form out by uh, July 25th, and that gives me two weeks to try to get you connected uh, with a group and to have a leader, and that gives that leader two weeks uh, to then uh, try to organize a date with all the people that are in this group to hopefully have a first meeting in September. Does that make sense? So trying to steer a bigger ship, it's not a speedboat, and you just do this. We need right, more time to get all these things in place. So I'm giving you two weeks and then those stages to get everybody in place uh, meeting in September. So I'm the one recruiting leaders. If you would like to be a part of that, I'm happy to train you in in, uh, uh, walking through, you know, what we do in the group. Uh, It is not crazy difficult. You know, any believer can do it, uh, and I'd love to help you uh, with some best practices with that in partnership uh, with the elders. And then if you have completed a year with a life group and you'd like to try a different group, maybe you were with a group that's very diverse and you enjoyed that, but you're like, you know, I think I'd like to try one with people that are more my age or vice versa. Whatever it is, you're saying, I'd like to make that transition. 
just have a conversation with your life group leader and say, you know, hey, this is what I'm thinking about, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking I might like to try a group that's different in this way or whatever, and then uh, you fill out a new uh, interest form, and then we get you connected uh, with a different group. So participation. So in July of 2020, uh, a year ago, we had three life groups, approximately 35 people, about 10% of the church. And then in one month, we went up to 18 life groups, 175 people, about half the church. And so when I think about what God did, okay, in that big jump, like that's huge, like to do that. Uh, And so what I call that uh, is COVID redeemed, So we were missing, right, being with each other, and we had that sense of need probably different than any other time in our lives, and the Lord said, yep, we're going to have you start a small group ministry, and we're going to get it rolling. So uh, when we think about uh, the goals that we have and the development, next slide, please. I'm just going to set this down because this just feels weird. Um, So September uh, 2021, uh, which is, you know, a month and a half, we're hoping to have seven more life groups and start pushing uh, that participation up to about 75% and uh, hoping that as many people as possible can get involved, and that's certainly our goal. And then hopefully a year from now, next slide please, uh, we can have closer to 90%. Now we know that in in this, in any plans that we make, right, you're never going to get 100% participation. We're just trying to get the highest Uh, that we can, because this is about us trying to do what we can to care uh, for you. Next slide, please. Uh, So we know there are certain people in our church who are unable, right, to to maybe physical limitations, to to participate in exactly the same way that other people do. We understand that. Possibly, you would consider, next slide, uh, hosting uh, a group where people are coming to you, right, and do whatever they can to accommodate your limitations and, and come and be Uh, there with you. Uh, And of course, not the ideal, but it's still a way of connecting and doing it through the internet by Zoom. So we we did that for a little while. Definitely not ideal, but it is better than having nothing, right? If you're trying to be connected, at least we have some of those opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, There's other people in the church who might be unsure about what it's like to be in a small group or in a life group. When I uh, asked all of our elders to raise your hand, if you grew up in a church with life groups, guess how many there were? right? Nobody grew up with small groups. Okay, so I'm going to ask all of you, raise your hand if you grew up in a church with small groups. Five out of however many are here. Okay, so as you can see, for West Michigan, for Redeemer in particular, right, it's a new thing. We get that. Totally understand that there is a learning curve when it comes to those things, so you might be a little more unsure about that. We are trying to do whatever we can to give you the information you need to make a prayerful decision about what's best for your spiritual life, and we're trying to equip you in these ways. Next slide. And there's a few of you that might be unwilling for whatever those reasons are. All we're asking is that you talk to us about whatever those reasons are because we do want to help in whatever way that we can uh, shepherd you in the best way. And this is what we are convinced of right now is going to be uh, the best way. From the results we've seen this year, we really think it's going to be uh, what's best for the church. Okay, so part of the pushing leadership downward, part of uh, serving in your areas of strength means we're also creating a new elder type. Okay, within the ruling elder, we have two different types of elders. The first elder is a direct shepherding elder. So their responsibilities include, first of all, shepherding their own life group. Next, uh, we see that's what they're doing. But in addition to that, uh, the uh, sh- direct shepherding elder is going to not only oversee the people in the 10 people in his group, he's going to also partner shepherd with the leaders of two or three other life groups that don't have an elder in them, right? We have a number led by deacons, a number led by other members, and we want to make sure each of those groups is connected with an elder so that you have uh, that overall uh, shepherding model. Some guys will lead you know, their own group and oversee one more, keep going, another one will lead potentially two more, and then two others leading three more uh, groups uh, as direct shepherding elders. Keep going. So for example, uh, Kirk is one of our direct shepherding elders. So he's uh, overseeing his own shepherding group, I mean his own life group, and then he'll oversee uh, the Bangmas and the Hills uh, life group as well. And for those that are already in the original group of the Bangmas, it's their second group, uh, just so you know. Uh, So then the next part uh, we have, uh, keep going. 
Uh, so what we're asking for is for our life group leaders to communicate monthly with this direct shepherding elder and then just communicate any necessary information. Now, I want to be super clear about this, okay? As I said, everything that happens in life groups stays in life groups. So this is not a breaking uh, of that confidentiality. But if we need to be aware of things, then we would be talking to you about it and say, would this be something that we can share with our shepherding elder, right? And they get your permission to share your information with a shepherding elder. It doesn't go. uh, Any specifics about you don't go to anybody without your permission because it's your life, right? So in this situation, though, you know, if we see certain patterns in general, then we can be more aware as the session is communicating with each other and with our life group leaders and just have a better sense of things going on within the congregation. So nothing specific about you as an individual, but just kind of general patterns. And if there is something specific, we get your permission first. So I hope we're 100% clear on the importance of confidentiality within these groups. Next, uh, we're asking that the direct elders contact all the members of their life groups uh, quarterly. Next, uh, that they plan a gathering annually of the three to four. Like, you know, so this would be like we had district meals in the past. This would be closer to that, where you have, you know, three or four life groups together. And some of you are already doing that. And some of you are doing it quarterly. We're just saying, at the minimum, try to do it annually, right? Those larger group coming together. And then we're also asking that the uh, direct shepherding elder will be meeting with the session quarterly. So if you're one of the elders and you just don't love going to meetings, right, and you just would prefer to be with people, we're trying to give you that place of focusing on people as your area of strength, but you still get to make all the same decisions because we don't make any decisions except quarterly. We're dealing with all the details uh, in those other two meetings, and then we all come back together to actually uh, vote on the different things that we're doing as a session. Next slide. Then is the, uh, not just the direct shepherding elder, but then you have the ones that are more general uh, over the congregation. Next slide. So their responsibilities would be they're shepherding their own life group, but then they're also going to be in contact with anybody in the church who does not have a life group, right? So they're going to have the broader uh, connection with people. So if you only had two elders over you in a district before, now you have four elders uh, that you can approach about whatever the issues are if you're not in a life group, uh, or if you have an elder in your life group, then that's going to be your shepherding elder. But as a general shepherding elder, for those that are not in life groups, they're going to oversee their own, uh, the non-life group members, and team care Uh, for those not in groups. But then these guys are also the ones that handle most of the administrative work of the church. Next slide. So they're going to meet with a session monthly. They're going to serve on on session and presbytery committees. They're going to be doing a lot more of the meeting type stuff uh, that we need to do uh, as a church and as a denomination. Next slide. So we have four uh, general shepherding elders. For example, uh, next slide. Uh, Howard Teft is one of our general shepherding elders, so he'll oversee his group, he'll oversee uh, non-life group members, and then he'll be involved as our clerk in session meetings and on committees uh, as well, okay? So what is this going to look like, right? The shepherding care through our life groups, what we're focusing on is the fact that when we push leadership downward, the regular care, personal care that every believer needs, right, other people praying for you, right, is happening within the life group. Okay, I have two uh, life groups, like I said, and after uh, Jessica's stepfather died a month ago, like, I didn't even think about it. The first thing I did was I sent a text message to each of those groups just as a gut reaction, right? That's a great net to have, right? Those people that I know are praying for us right away, like right in that moment. Those are the first people I shot out information to. And so we hope that every one of you have those go-to people, and that's what the life group is is all about, those personal uh, issues that you can uh, walk through with together. And just as another point of... um, how, how this has worked in, in, in our, my first life group, in that life group alone, okay, in the last nine months, five parents have died, okay, in that one life group. So we have walked through death after death after death together, and just the way God has used that group, I just, I can't say enough about how the care has been a blessing to us. Okay, next slide. We obviously know that you know, as leaders, right, you know, there's certain things you're going to feel like, okay, I can't, this is a little bit bigger than what I feel like our group 
can handle. And so we're just saying, if something like that comes up, you talk to that person and you say, hey, can we bring in our shepherding elder uh, into this conversation? You know, can we bring in uh, one of our pastors to talk about this? Because we feel like this is such a critical thing for your life, and we want to get you the best care that's possible. And so we partner together in whatever those more critical uh, issues are that the group itself, it's not the day-to-day stuff. It's something a little more major that we want to come alongside uh, and help with. Next slide. Uh, also, if there is any you know, conversation that comes up in your life group and it is relevant to church policy or church practice, uh, we are asking you to refer those questions to the shepherding elder uh, who then, if needed, could refer those things to the session. And so by that, you know, those that are sitting around the table trying to work through those issues are able to address those concerns uh, directly. Uh, pastors basically function like general shepherding elders, but we're also involved in regularly equipping leaders, and we're also involved in the most immediate needs of members, right? When there is a hospitalization, when there's a death, serious personal issues, weddings, baptisms, like all those things, we are like right involved as much as we can in each of those things, okay? Okay. Now, as Jeff mentioned, right, life groups and small groups are good opportunities for other things as well. And so this doesn't exist right now, but we're hopeful that it could exist in the future, uh, discovery groups for outreach, okay? So imagine people coming through the back door to church by coming in a discovery group. So if you were someone who wanted to host a discovery group in your home, and you might invite a mixture, right, of members and then your neighbors, right, your coworkers, other people that may not darken the door of a church as easily as coming to your house for a dinner, right? And then take that next step. Hey, we were thinking about, you know, are you interested in learning a little bit more about Christianity? Next slide. You know, we have this thing called Christianity Explored, and we'd love to walk through that with you. And that's a great series. There's other ones that are out there, but that's one that has been very helpful. Next slide. We also would like to use connect groups for assimilation, right? So maybe you've come to Redeemer. There's a whole bunch of people in that foyer. You're just looking around. You're just like, oh my goodness, like how am I going to meet all these different people? And so uh, we want to invite visitors and attendees to join a connect group as a way of getting to know more people in the church. And then you have that connection with a smaller group of people. And when you walk through those doors, you see those few people and you have those conversations. And it just is so much easier to try to kind of get your brain wrapped around, right, all the things going on at Redeemer when you have that smaller group of people. And it's possible that, uh, well, sorry, with most life groups, they happen, they, they're they committed to a year. But with an assimilation group, that one could be added to at any time during the whole year. So any person shows up on Sunday and, hey, you know, would you be interested in being a part uh, of our um, connect group? Oh, sure. And then it doesn't matter what Sunday it is or what week it is, they can be part of that. And potentially at the end of that year, those people that have been meeting together, you know, throughout that time, they might want to become a life group because they've really enjoyed the time that they spent together. And so we think with this as outreach, with this as assimilation, along with our open houses, it's going to be a way to just walk with people as relationally as possible, as, as face-to-face as possible uh, to help them get connected with other believers in the church and to draw closer uh, to the Lord by walking in grace together. Okay, so there's our presentation. Uh, I want to say at this point, meeting's over, but I want to answer, and Jeff wants to answer any questions that you might have about life groups. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, just, yes. Yeah, so a, a life group is, is, is the main area uh, that is existing right now. Okay, the other two I said are ideas for the future. So a, a discovery group is what I was saying. is like it's more of an outreach small group. Like that's where people, you, you bring them in. Uh, from your neighborhood, from coworkers, friends like that. It's, it's like it's considered an evangelistic group. It's targeted on outreach. Uh, the Connect group, uh, we're just saying, is a way of bringing in new people that have visited the church and are interested in getting more involved. But Life Groups has already started. And, and, and in my experience, once you have that group together, you add a new person. And what ends up happening is the, the depth of relationship that you've been able to get to in that life group goes right back to the surface because you added a new person. With 
connect groups uh, as a way of assimilating people, okay, you're adding new people all the time, and they know that from the beginning. So with life groups, it's September to August. It's a one-year commitment. These other two groups would be different. They don't exist right now, right? They're future developments. I'm just trying to give you ideas for how small groups can be used in more ways than one. The biggest, the biggest picture right now is life groups are, are how we're trying to shepherd the church. That's the main idea to get today. These are just ideas for the future. So sorry if that wasn't clear. Yes, Joyce. Okay, I'm sure they're in favor of that. So, yeah, it's actually reducing the total number of people they have to care for. And by pushing leadership downward, uh, we're actually going to be more effective than trying to care for 50 people because they're caring for 10 on a regular basis. And through their other leaders, they're caring for other people through them. So, hopefully, that. Yes, it's actually less work wide. It's deeper work for each individual. That's what we're hoping. Okay, other questions, comments? Sue. Yeah, so that's where the general shepherding elders are, are overseeing. Anybody that's not in a life group, uh, they have them as their, their uh, shepherding elder. Uh, so I would say, even though districts are, are, are no longer in, in effect, right, we're, 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 the district model is now transitioning as of today, but if you want to liken it to that, it would be closer to that, where there are a broader number of people with four elders over anybody that's not in a life group. Oh, sure, yeah. So I'm so glad you mentioned that. So... Uh, the, I, I didn't want to get into all the details of which elder is doing what in this particular meeting. I wanted to keep it conceptual. Uh, but early this week, uh, the direct shepherding elders uh, that are overseeing um, their life groups, okay, are going to be sending out an email to let them know that I'm going to be your shepherding elder. And the four uh, general shepherding elders that are, are overseeing people that are not in life groups will be sending an email to them. So you say, okay, we're, we're your guys. You bring stuff to us. So that'll happen early this week by email to each of you as individuals. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, so this is one of the venues for making you aware of things, right? So we're having an informational meeting, right? We're putting as much information as we can out there. Uh, email, I mean, we can print stuff and put it in people's boxes uh, and communicate that way as well. Um, but yeah, we're kind of in an email age when that's pretty normal. But yeah, good question. Sorry, yes, Kristen. Great question. So uh, for those that didn't hear it, if you're online or whatever, uh, when because we have a rotating model of eldership, uh, how does it work with the leadership of shepherding with rotating elders? So, you know, it is new for us. So we're going to have a number of things we're going to be figuring out. But I'm going to tell you that uh, my best understanding of this is if there is a particular elder, let's say he's rotating off of session, okay, but he would continue leading his life group, right? Like it's unlikely, you know, I mean, maybe he wants to step down from that leadership as well. I don't know. It depends on the situation. But let's just say most likely he would want to continue that, but he's just not serving actively on the session, right? Then we would have an active session member probably overseeing, and he would just be one of the, the non-elder life groups. That's my guess right now because we're not there yet. But um, most likely what would happen? So what is not clear? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just, I, yes, just talk to me about that. So, you know, what, en- what ends up happening is people fill out the, the life group interest form. I get those forms. I try to connect people together, um, you know, with uh, other people that are, have similar interests. And then once it gets to about 10, 
right, then we're going to say, okay, that group is formed, right? If we, something happens, we had to add like one more person or, or another couple, we can do that. We can go to 12, but we're going to be shooting for 10 with everybody. And so um, the growth is probably going to come and, you know, uh, be paused right around September timeframe, because that's when we're starting the year commitment to the next August. So unless you're like inviting people and not telling me about that, and then you just keep adding people, like, I mean, I guess you could do that. It's not exactly what we're looking to do. Uh, but if that happened, uh, I mean, I'd like to get more people involved, um, but it might be through a different method than just getting a group of 18 or 20 together, because that just becomes not a life group. That's a different thing. That's, you know, it's a big gathering of believers. So we want to care for people on a smaller number. Mary. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as people grow in experience um, and we are, are talking through what's required as a leader, you know, I mean, there are, um, you know, a number of uh, different things that happen um, within a group that a person, you know, who didn't really know what was involved in leadership, after they walk through that uh, over the course of a few months, they realize, oh, okay, this is not like, you don't have to be Bible answer man, you know, you don't have to know everything to be a leader, right? Like they start realizing, okay, you know, maybe I'll do it a little differently than this person, but I understand better what's involved. So there is that learning and partnering that occurs anyway uh, with within the group. Uh, But my role is to walk alongside of every person that's a leader and to equip them with whatever they need, right? So I will do an initial training with anybody that's new. uh, And then for those that want to, you know, continue growing in things, I will always have resources and always have things to do to try to help them in, in serving in that particular role. Yes, Jody. No, this only people not already in a life group I'm asking to fill out that form. I already know right now, well, as long as I've been communicated with, I know who's already in those groups. Yeah. So you don't have to fill it out again. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so this is not the last time you can answer, ask questions. Send me an email. Send an email to any of the elders. We'd love to help you with this. But everybody have a wonderful Sunday, and uh, we'll see you tonight.